Thank you, testing. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you, students. We really appreciate your feedback, and we will uh, read all of your comments and try to incorporate your uh, constructive feedback into the remainder, remainder of the uh, course. So thank you very much for doing that. Um, you'll remember this is a technology-free zone, just it's the courtesy to our speakers. We ask you to put away your screens for the next hour and a half or so. And also wanted to remind you that you have your first paper due. Did anybody remember that? Or it's due next Wednesday by 6 p.m. Pacific time. We do have a markdown program if you don't get it in on time, so please be sure to read that. Also, I just want to really encourage all of you to be thinking and working on a draft of this paper. This was not an easy question. You'll remember it's really about how are you going to calculate the consequences of your choices. And this question has a kind of a creative design dimension in terms of coming up with an idea for a restaurant. And then you have to pick one of the simple dishes on that restaurant and trace the supply chain of all the ingredients. So this requires some thinking, some forethought, and probably some review with you know, one of your friends or colleagues. This is not one to leave for the night before. So I'd also encourage you that if you haven't already and you need help to reach out to myself or one of the readers or the GSI in the course, they're very happy to help you but you got to give them a heads up that you want a 15 or 20 minutes of their time. Okay, and not the day before, but you've got still a week to go. All right? Now, remember our kind of secret power, our, our superpower that we're trying to develop in this class is around transparency. Um, we have been trying to peer behind the, um, the scenes to understand the truth in the food system. And you'll recall that last week we got a look inside transparently into our microbiomes and learned all about how um, some, how this sort of ecosystem functions, not, not a pastoral, lovely, calm ecosystem like Bruce German said, but a very harsh environment where bacteria eat other bacteria. It was quite, who, who enjoyed that? lecture last week. That was one of my favorites. Yeah, thanks for coming to that. So this week we're going to zoom out from inside to outside and we're just really lucky to have two very um, special guests. Um, Anna LaPay, who you had a chance to read some of her books, she is really one of the very important voices in the uh, food movement. She's the author of several books. Both she and our other guest Sophie Egan, are really talented writers. Um, they're both incredibly curious and inquisitive. They're both like investigative journalists who bring a really approachable um, view to their work. And I'm just delighted that Anna and Sophie are here. Now, Sophie also is a recent graduate of the MPH program here at Berkeley, and I asked her to come because I wanted her to not only share some of a little reading from her brand new fantastic book, Devoured, but also to um, share with you a little bit about her path from student to professional. And what I hope you'll get out of that, and you'll, you'll hear from other Berkeley alumni with varied backgrounds during the class, is how do I take my education and how do I take my, you know, my personal interests and passions and how do I manifest that into some kind of employment. And so um, Sophie's going to elaborate on that today. So just to take attendance today, take out your clicker. One of the great topics we learned about last week was fiber. So what was your relationship to fiber this week? A, I sought it out and ate more of it. B, I paid more attention to labels. I certainly did that. C, didn't give it a second thought. Let's see how we came out. So A, I sought it out and ate more of it. B, I paid more attention to labels. And C, I didn't think a second, give it a second thought. How are we doing? Should I switch? We're going to stop now. Do I do this? One second.
Wow, that's pretty good. So f over half of you actually ate more fiber intentionally. I think Christopher Gardner would be really happy to hear that. We'll have to send him that result. All right, let's do one more question just for my sake. Uh, the modern biotechnology industry adheres to, this comes from one of Anna's readings, the modern biotechnology industry adheres to A, a set of strict regulations, B, a central dogma developed by Francis Crick, or C, a rigorous commitment to testing products before commercial release. Who wagers a guess on this one? Or who did the reading? Let's see. Please vote with your clicker. What? Uh huh. A little slower. Guessing. <laughs> people are guessing. People are looking at their neighbors. A little cheating going on. There's a little changes here. Back and forth. People can't decide. Five more seconds. Okay, I'm going to switch so you can see how fluid this answer is. Whoop. Where'd it go? Aha. <laughs> uh -huh. I guess we can't control when we stop the poll, huh? Okay, well, the right answer is B, the central dogma that was discussed in Anna's chapter was talking about how the biotechnology industry projects that everything is predictable in their work, and I'm sure you're going to hear more from her on that. So quickly, just um, to finish up, to refresh everybody's mind and also to show those of you that are joining us for the first time. And by the way, we have a whole contingent from Denmark here tonight. Can just wave. They've come all the way to Denmark to go to edible education. So this is for their benefit. The first week, Alice Waters talked about food values and particularly slow food values and the rights of us to have um, food. Second week was David Moss Masamoto, a third generation farmer who really talked to us about the joy of farming and the collaborative effort of farming. That was followed by Professor Robert Reich, who really talked about concentration of power in the food industry and where um, economic power and, uh, and, um, and policy power kind of come together in, in a way that creates a lot of um, inequality. Naomi Starkman, the founder of uh, Civil Eats, was here to talk to us about the importance of a free press. We've seen this whole class kind of play out in real time. Saru Jayaraman was here talking about labor issues in food. And the next week, we saw the proposed nominee for the Secretary of Labor sort of kicked out of that process. She was very happy about that. Then last week, we got introduced to the microbiome. We had the three musketeers of microbiota. Bruce and Christopher and Justin, and we ended up with the good gut. So that brings us to today, our very special guest. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm going to do this now. Next week, because I don't get to do this at the end, we are going to have a food and tech showcase. We're actually going to have six speakers from really amazing early stage companies. Three of them are Berkeley alums. And so it's going to be a virtual tasting menu of what's happening in food and technology. So be here for next week. And now, without further ado, I, it's a really great honor to welcome our next speaker, somebody who I just have enormous respect for. And I have to say, I haven't told Anna this, but I met her mother, Frances Moore LePay, who wrote really one of this very, very important seminal books in this whole, at the beginning of this food movement, Diet for a Small Planet. And I think I met her in 1990, and she was very kind and incredibly smart. And um, I learned from her, and I think you'll also learn from Anna, that there is a way to be active and persuasive in this world that is not um, alienating, that is not divisive, but is um, based in facts and based in education and based in persistence. So without further ado, please welcome Anna LePay. So much. Is this on? Can you I hear me? will make sure that. Can you hear me? Thanks for the water. Can you guys hear me in the back? Is this loud enough? You can hear me. I see one thumb up, so I'm going to assume you can all hear me. Doesn't sound very loud. Here, I'm, I'm yeah. pushing this louder. Is that louder? Let's see. 
can move this up a little bit. Sorry, you can see we didn't sound check this before. Is that any that's, better? That's good. Yeah? yeah? Okay, good. I am also losing my voice a little bit, so we can even go up I'll a go tad. Up. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much. It is such a huge pleasure to be back here. I've spoken to some of the edible education classes in the past, and UC Berkeley has a special place in my heart. I, I went to Brown University, but I spent my last semester here at UC Berkeley, and I loved it, so it is really fun to be back. Um, how's that for sound levels? Good. Yeah? Okay, great. Um, great. And the clicker, I've got it. Great. So um, I... Um, what, I, what we're going to talk about today, as I arrange things here, hang on a second. So what we're going to talk about today is this really big question, how we're going to feed the future. Experts have been debating this question for a long time, and both national, international policymakers have been basing their decisions based on, on these debates. Uh, so I don't presume with such a huge question that I am going to come anywhere close to answering that question for all of us tonight. But what I tried to do was I thought about what I wanted to share with all of you is to give you some ideas about how we might approach this question, where solutions might lie, and, and hopefully really provoke some thinking and provoke some questions. And, and we'll have some time for conversation at the end, so even provoke some debate. Um, but first, I wanted to just tell you a little bit about how I found myself here. I was raised in Oakland and San Francisco. Back then, San Francisco was a very different city. It was the kind of city where a single mother on a nonprofit salary could buy a house and uh, raise her two kids, as my mom did. And we moved to San Francisco when I was really young. And when we moved there, my mother, who Will was just referring to, Frances Morlapay, started an organization called the Institute for Food and Development Policy. It's uh, also known as Food First. And it is still, four decades later, uh, still around and still really asking these questions about how do we feed the world and um, why myths about world hunger persist. So in many ways, I have been hearing people debate this question for a long time. As a kid, uh, my childhood was, um, maybe as some of you might imagine, uh, knowing a little bit about my mother, you know, she was not uh, taking us off to Disneyland. Instead, my vacations were visiting factory farms in California, uh, farm worker encampments in the Midwest, or going with her on research trips to Central America. And, uh, you know, in the evenings, instead of watching TV, in fact, for most of my childhood, our TV was kept in a closet. Um, we, instead of watching TV, I spent uh, evenings uh, stuffing envelopes for fundraisers for her nonprofit. So this was way before there was email fundraising drives, uh, or listening to her and her colleagues kind of debate big issues about world hunger. And you know, I'll admit there was a, definitely a big part of me as a kid that longed for you know just watching whatever was on television and being able to talk about it in school the next day or you know, playing with Barbie, which I also never got to do, uh, or eating actual chocolate. My mom was really into carob, which was big in the 1970s. I don't know if it's still, I mean, you know, this argument that it tastes like chocolate, it never did. Um, so you know, there was a part of me that missed a lot of that, but there was also this huge part of me as a kid that I really, I really loved to be part of what felt like so energizing, felt like so much bigger than just my family and myself. Myself. And, um, and I really, really loved that about my childhood. And so as time went on, I went to college. As I, as I said, I went to Brown. And then I went to New York City. And in my early 20s, I really found myself a bit adrift. I was trying to figure out uh, what, what it would look like for myself to plug into something bigger than just my own life. You know, what it would look like to really try to make a difference. And, and to be honest, I really wasn't coming up with any answers. So like many 20-somethings struggling with that question, I um, decided to try graduate school. I thought I might discover some of those answers and find, find my way by going to graduate school. So I went to Columbia in their economic and political development program. I was studying globalization and trade policy. And uh, one evening, I was reading the New York Times. And I read this tiny little article that mentioned that there was going to be a World Trade Organization meeting in Seattle. And uh, that there was going to be uh, some local groups that were organizing some teach-ins and even some protests 
uh, because those advocates that were organizing those protests and teach-ins were saying that the policies of this World Trade Organization would take away the ability for local communities and states and nations uh, to be able to do things like protect farmers, protect local food, uh, to be able to preserve really strict environmental regulations, and so much more. So that very night, after reading that article, I decided I really wanted to be there, to be there for this teach-in and for this little protest I was reading about. So I cobbled together some frequent flyer miles, bought a ticket, found a friend of a friend uh, whose couch I could crash on. And the next thing I knew, uh, I was standing in the middle of downtown Seattle. I had gone all by myself, but I was not alone. There were tens of thousands of people in the streets of Seattle. It was uh, really one of the biggest uh, uh, demonstrations ever, certainly against a trade policy. Uh, but it was a massive demonstration in the streets um, in December 1999. And I remember standing there, and I remember I was so cold. If you've ever spent time in a rainy day in Seattle, you know what I'm talking about. I was freezing. My sneakers were totally soaking wet, and I was in so many ways physically miserable, but I was also so inspired by the energy all around me. And so I'll never forget this particular moment. I was sort of getting that sense of the energy around me, and I look over to my right, and there was a huge troop of topless lesbian Avengers. They were a radical queer group that was marching in the demonstrations. They were topless except for they had electrical tape across, you know, as pasties. And then on my left was a huge contingent of kind of burly United auto workers. And all of these people were sort of chanting in, in unison. And I remember having this moment that, you know, those lesbian Avengers and those auto workers were just kind of, for me, this symbol of what was happening in the streets that day. And the symbol for me was that what this fight was about, about trying to democratize the World Trade Organization, wasn't about workers versus the environment or feminists against farmers, um, that it really was about all of us together taking on corporate power and saying that corporate dictated trade policy should not supersede democratically determined policy. It was in many ways as basic as that. So after this experience, I returned to Columbia and, and everything in my classes looked different. You know, I started to read my text differently and sit in econ classes differently and what had been sort of foreign, uh, you know, abstract foreign policy really felt real to me. And that energy that I felt in the streets really kept me up at night, uh, reflecting on how I might be able to contribute. So I ended up petitioning my advisors to let me work with my mother on a book um, to sort of tell the story of some of these uh, social movements that were at the forefront forefront of promoting, uh, promoting democracy worldwide and really addressing the root causes of hunger. So for that book, my mother and I traveled to India, Bangladesh, Poland, Kenya, France, and a bunch of places in the US, and we still get along today. Um, we traveled uh, to all these different places looking at where there were examples of social movements and organizations, even city governments that were leading the way in tackling the root causes of hunger. And really, since the 15 years since then, uh, I've continued this work, as we'll mention, through a couple of other books, through my work with a project called Real Food Media, uh, now with advising philanthropists that are working to fund a transformation in the food system. And so I come to this work from this background. I am not an economist. I am not a farmer. Uh, I don't have a narrow expert's credential. Uh, I'm not you know, a particular expert on the microbiome, although I love those folks, and that is great. Um, what, I, what I bring is really a generalist's perspective and a huge passion for sharing the stories of people that are at the heart of the food system, the workers, the farmers, the food producers, and the agricultural experts. And so as we ponder this big question about how we'll feed the future, I really do so with the voices of these leaders that I've met all around the world in, um, in sort of in the front of my mind. And I also do so, of course, knowing that we are you know, talking to you all at a particular historic moment in this country, at a time when this new administration in office is led by many climate denialists, while, meanwhile, you might have heard a 17-mile-wide crack just burst across Antarctica, right? Uh, that we know that this president's cabinet is stacked with CEOs uh, threatening massive welfare cuts. Uh, meanwhile, we know there's massive malnourishment across this country around the world. Um, so, so we're in this context 
Uh, I, I know what I'm about to say next might sound to your ears a bit unwarranted, but I'm going to say it, which is that I, I really am standing here tonight uh, to bear and to bring some good news about fighting hunger. And I hope by the time I am done, you have a sense of this good news too. What I'm here to share is that from this vantage point I have of, of, of talking with folks really around the world, that what we are hearing is that we have the knowledge and the technologies today, right now, to create the kind of food systems we need to be truly sustainable. And it's, it's not just my belief, I don't just feel this, although I do feel it, uh, it is really what we are hearing from farmers uh, and folks on the ground that are seeing this with their own eyes. Of course, we are far from this food system today. Uh, my mother just republished her, her seminal book, World Hunger 12 Myths. It was retitled World Hunger 10 Myths. I said, great mom, did you, did you beat those two myths? She said, no, we just condensed them. So World Hunger 10 Myths. Uh, but so you can see, you know, we still have this incredible amount of hunger, almost a billion people going hungry, while the world is producing actually enough food to feed all of us. And as my mother and Food First and many other colleagues have been saying for so many years, Hunger is not caused by a scarcity of production, it is caused by a scarcity of democracy, of people able to decide what kind of food is produced, where that food is produced, who has power and say over that food that gets produced. And what, what my mother and her colleagues and all of us are really um, uh, talking about is then solutions for feeding the future that aren't about producing more, for if it was just a production question, we should have no hunger on the planet today, that what we're saying is that we need a food system that really works at the intersection of these three core values. That if we're going to have a sustainable food system, I mean, this is so, so basic in many ways, but I think it's really important to, to name these, that we need to be producing healthy food, we need to be protecting the environment, and we need to promote the well-being of food producers. You can imagine if this was like a three-legged stool, if any one of those legs were taken away, the stool would no longer stand. So, we approach this from understanding then, we need all three of those pieces in order to be able to feed the future, to have a sustainable system. These are kind of the non-negotiables as I would describe them. And what I'm here to tell you is that we are seeing inklings of a food system that meets all of these values at once, appearing all around the world. I've seen it from Malaysia to Malawi, from Bhutan to Bolivia, we're seeing it in places around the world uh, and it would be flourishing much more were it not for powerful forces mounted against it, forces that battle this kind of food system in the halls of our Congress, in the regulatory office of the Environmental Protection Agency and international bodies, uh, even on your Facebook feeds and Twitter streams. It's a battle over really our hearts and minds, what we believe is possible and what we believe is progress for food. So, when we talk about this battle over our hearts and minds, I really see that there are three key questions, I'm gonna take us through each one, that, uh, that we need to be asking and really grappling with if we wanna create this kind of sustainable food system. One is what do we believe really is the future of eating? What does that look like? What do we believe uh, are the food and agricultural technologies to get us there, to get us to this kind of sustainable system? And then what are the types of food, the very seeds that we need then to promote the kind of food system that we need to ensure that everyone is well fed? So this first question, what is the future of eating? A few years ago, I was at a, a conference with a number of uh, food industry executives. And one of them stood up and said, he was, he was giving his remarks and he said, we envision a day when it will seem as bizarre to the consumer to cook their own food as it is to sew their own jeans. And it really stuck with me, that comment, that that's the vision for some food industry executives, clearly not all of them, uh, but that's the vision for their future of eating for them. And it's a vision, certainly, that's profitable for the industry. Because think about it, if you and I no longer are cooking for ourselves, then we are totally dependent on buying our processed and packaged food from someone else. 
and it's certainly the direction we've been heading here in the United States. I was uh, talking recently with a colleague who's te a teacher at an elementary school in Vermont, and she was talking about grade schoolers who were coming to her and she had to teach them how to use a fork and a spoon and a knife. Because think about it, if you have a Pop-Tart for breakfast and a slice of pizza for lunch and a hamburger for dinner, you have not used a single utensil. A few months ago, I was invited to attend a, a session on the future of food at the headquarters of Airbnb in San Francisco. And it was hosted by a bunch of people who are futurists. I didn't realize that was a profession. It is. Uh, so there are futurists for big brands. You're in business school, so maybe this is like, you know, you guys are all futurists. Uh, but they were brought these experts together to kind of brainstorm, you know, what is the future of food. And in this futurist, uh, lexicon, maybe you know this, they talk about signals. And so what are the signals? What are the signs that they're seeing about? What are some trends that they're seeing? And so one of the signals that they mentioned was Soylent. And again, I know I'm speaking in a business school, so you might even have some investors of Soylent here. So uh, I, I know, I'm aware of that. Uh, so uh, Soylent, have you all heard of it? I'm seeing some nodding. OK, so Soylent uh, is presented by its investors, by its makers, as a way to disrupt eating, to kind of improve the food system through innovation. Innovative, I don't know. For about I don't know. For me, I'm not so sure. I actually got a bottle of it just because I was like, I should try this. I should really try it. And I smelled it. I couldn't even try it. Uh, but when you look at the ingredients of Soylent, I notice it's actually only eight eight ingredients different from Ensure, which is like the meal replacement that's been on the market forever. You know, I'm not so sure that this is innovation, and yet we look at, on the right, that's, you know, food. That's food, and I, and I think it's a question I have, is the future of food, it might just be food. It might be actually <laughs> eating real food and not being dependent on a manufacturer to make uh, a product like Soylent. So, the second question to be asking is this question about the, the, what does the future of farming look like? And, and here, this is, my, this is my, ma my mashup for this question. My pictures are a little pixelated, but on the right, that's chili. And on the left, it's a Dow chemical product called chlorpyrifos, which um, is known by, in this case, Lorsban is one of the brand, uh, its brand names. Uh, they're both essentially insecticides. So we hear from the chemical industry that something like chlorpyrifos is what we need to feed the future. We hear from uh, chemical companies like Syngenta uh, saying comments like, and if you read the chapter, you heard me quote a Syngenta executive saying that organic farming, not using those kinds of chemicals, is a waste of agricultural land when the world needs more crop output. Now, industry groups argue that the technologies of industrial farming, like these agricultural chemicals, are also not that harmful. We don't have to really worry about them. It's what we hear from companies themselves and from their trade groups, groups like CropLife America, which used to be known as the National Association of Chemical Manufacturers until probably they got some really smart business school students to rebrand them as CropLife. But so what, what does CropLife tell us? It tells us we don't really need to worry about these chemicals. They don't really cause any harm. Um, but we have actually known for decades that toxic pesticides are at the heart, that are at the heart of industrial agriculture, have huge impact. They have impact on farmland worldwide. Uh, they have impact on ecosystems worldwide. We know, for instance, that a lot of the pesticides that are used in agriculture, only a tiny fraction of them are actually uh, taken up by uh, and uh, actually used on the farm itself. But that traces of these chemicals can now be found in waterways and oceans, soils and grasses, from rainforests in South America to uh, the Arctic ice. We know from some studies done right here at the University of California at Berkeley, we now have long-term studies looking at farm workers and their families that show that communities that are exposed to agricultural pesticides have higher rates of, uh, of um, ADHD and autism, children have developmental delays. We know from major studies uh, that have been done of agricultural communities uh, nationwide that farmers and pesticide applicators have higher rates of Parkinson's disease and certain cancers, other illnesses. So we know these things. And in particular, chlorpyrifos, a widely used insecticide, it's been around since 1965. And yet we have known for decades that it doesn't just 
hurt the insects it's meant to kill, but that it, it affects humans too. And in fact, in the early 2000s, uh, we banned this pesticide uh, from most home use precisely because researchers found it alarming from home. I wonder if our friends from Denmark, you, you know, chances are your country doesn't allow this to be used on your farms. Uh, the EPA now has evidence that this insecticide causes neuro neurodevelopmental effects in fetuses and children. Um, they include the kinds of things I mentioned, uh, lower IQ, attention problems, increased risk of autism spectrum disorder. But despite this evidence, this insecticide is still used worldwide in about 100 countries. And in the United States, it's still used very widely. Six million pounds of the chemical are used every year on over 50 crops. And it's looking like this new administration with this new EPA head won't take steps to ban it anytime soon. Okay, so in this matchup between Chlorpyrifus on one side and Chile on the other, let's turn to Chile. So a few years ago, I attended the biannual meeting of the International Federation of Organic Agricultural Movements, kind of a mouthful of an association name. Uh, their acronym is IFOAM, which is not also a great acronym. Uh, but it is a, a group of, uh, of representatives of uh, farming communities and organic agricultural specialists. And I heard report after report of studies showing natural insecticides, natural alternatives to this thing that we know is harmful. Uh, one of the examples I heard was about Chile. Uh, and there was one research talk to, researcher talked about his work with West African farmers whose fields had been decimated by pests. And his team discovered that some of the chilies that were native to the region were a natural repellent for those particular pests. They tried an experiment growing some chilies on the perimeter of the field, crushing that chili into a spray, using it on the crops. Guess what? It worked. It worked and no one had to worry that maybe their children would become sick. Maybe they would get cancer. Maybe they would have an acute uh, bout of pesticide poisoning. It worked. We're hearing examples like this all around the world. I just saw a, a study recently um, out of East Africa by a group locally, the Oakland Institute, that reported on a farmer network there using natural practices, again, to deal with pests. Uh, there, the practice uh, that's widely used in other parts of the world is called the push-pull uh, system. So it's pretty simple. Farmers plant fodder and wild grasses alongside the crops that they uh, want to protect, and pests uh, are, are pulled toward these decoy crops. And uh, in the case of these farmers in East Africa, the pests ignored their corn crop and instead went for those decoys. The results, in this particular study, 96,000 farmers in the network were benefiting enormously. Corn yields in the region shot up nearly threefold and farmers were saving on costly inputs. So these are some of the qualities on the right of this kind of natural way of farming. Agroecological principles are called, or organic farming practices. What we're seeing worldwide are efforts to promote uh, this kind of knowledge intensive farming, to look at uh, how to promote biodiversity, integrating trees, for instance, into the farms, to promote open pollinated seeds, encourage saving and sharing seeds, uh, to foster resilience in the face of drought and flood, uh, and to do all of this thing with less energy use, less water, and no pesticides. So I imagine uh, if you're with me so far, you'd say, okay, those benefits sound pretty positive. Uh, but when I hear, when I ask people what words come to their mind, typically when they hear the word organic or if they ever hear the word agroecology, which they rarely have, uh, what do I hear in response? People say, oh, that's, that might be nice, Anna, but that's, that's not really progress, that's not innovation, it's kind of quaint, it's artisanal, expensive, um, or it's you know, Luddites who don't really want to work with technology. But what I'm suggesting is what would it look like if we shifted our narrative about those matchups between chlorpyrifus and chilies um, and soylent and real food and saw instead that that chemical arsenal we've been using for decades, by the way, uh, is antiquated, that it isn't progress or innovation, uh, and that instead we started to see that organic farming could really be that kind of disruptive technology to have us think differently about our food system. And so really what I'm suggesting is we really need to be thinking about what do we mean by technology? What is technology? And I think many people assume 
that the technologies that we see taking hold uh, flourish, expand, because they are the best. They are the most efficient. That's why they're kind of winning in the marketplace. By this logic, then, chemical agriculture is winning in the marketplace because it must be better than organic practices. A chemical agriculture must persist because farmers aren't making the alternatives work. What I'm suggesting is that there's a different story about technology and that there are always forces behind a technology's introduction and its success. And these forces are not neutral. One of the best writers on this subject uh, is a theorist named Langdon Winner. And he wrote a book uh, called The Whale and the Reactor. And he puts it this way. Technologies, he says, embody specific forms of power and authority. He writes, there is an ongoing social process in which scientific knowledge, technological innovation, and corporate profit reinforce each other in deeply entrenched patterns, patterns that bear the unmistakable stamp of political and economic power. So organic agriculture, I would say, is not flourishing faster and, and, and spreading wider, in part because of the vested interests in the global food corporations that are threatened by this way of farming. Uh, these vested interests have been aggressively promoting chemical agriculture through lobbying, elected officials, fighting regulation, blocking research. Consider, for instance, globally, less than 2% of all research dollars that have been spent have gone to exploring the benefits of organic agriculture. So one of the clearest examples of kind of this intersection of politics and technology when it comes to food is, uh, the, uh, is the seed and farming practice that was pushed in the global south and, and called the Green Revolution. How many of you have studied the Green Revolution already? OK, so just a handful of you. So the Green Revolution, it was funded by, uh, by US foundations. And it was first launched in Mexico in the early 1940s and brought to India, Southeast Asia in the 50s and 60s. The idea was, and the Green Revolution term refers to, uh, development of kind of a package of technologies. It was mainly wheat and rice varieties of seeds that were bred to be highly responsive to heavy applications of fertilizer, carefully controlled irrigation, and chemical pesticides. The technology was inherently super capital intensive, meaning uh, the hybrid seeds had to be purchased each year. They would lose what was known as their hybrid vigor, so a farmer couldn't just replant them. So you, capital intensive in that you had to keep buying the seeds. But also capital intensive, you had to get a tractor. You had to lay down the irrigation. Uh, they were monocultures, one kind of crop. So you're talking about you needed a lot of land to really make it efficient and work. And so while the Green Revolution has historically been lauded as a triumph in kind of addressing this question about how to feed us all, critics have actually stressed the technology will have actually exacerbated food insecurity and that its original goals were never to have supported small-scale farming and biodiversity and the kinds of principles that we talked about at the beginning. In a really fabulous book with a very uh, dry title, America's Foundations, uh, which I highly recommend, uh, investigative journalist Mark Dowie delved into the archives of the philanthropies that funded the Green Revolution. And what he argues in this book, looking at the archives, is that the motivation behind this technology was geopolitical. The program built the power of large landowners undermining the peasant and socialist movements that were mobilizing during that period in Mexico, in India, the Philippines. It was seen by funders as a way to stabilize these regions in the face of the Red Revolution of communism and the White Revolution with the rise of the Shah of Iran, thus the Green Revolution. And so while the Green Revolution technologies increased yields for those farmers who implemented the practices, uh, what we saw was uh, that there was an incredible increase in fertilizer use. There was an incredible increase in capital deployed. Uh, what's not graphed here is the increase. Uh, this, the top line is fertilizer. What's not graphed is the increase in chemicals. Uh, we also saw many farmers were indebted. Uh, we saw increased foreign dependency, depleted water tables. The topsoils in a lot of these regions was destroyed. Um, 
one of the things I found really fascinating in Mark Dowie's book is he, again, goes into the archives and he found a handwritten letter from a University of California geographer to the Rockefeller Foundation in 1944 about the Green Revolution. And in that document, this geographer said, basically warned against this plan to move forward with this technology. And he said, aggressive agronomists and plant breeders could ruin the native resources for good and all, for good and all by pushing their commercial stocks. Mexican agriculture cannot be pointed towards standardization on a few commercial types without upsetting native economy and culture hopelessly. Unless the Americans understand that, they'd better keep out of this country entirely. This thing must be approached from an appreciation of the native that the native economies are basically sound. Now, instead of heeding these warnings, the funders brought the Green Revolution to other countries around the world. Uh, and one of the places that they brought this Green Revolution to, these technologies to, was the Punjab in, in India. And so when my mother and I were writing our book, that was one of the places that we went to see, in part, the impact of the Green Revolution, but to also see the emergence of organic agriculture. And we were drawn there to meet with farmers who were supposed to be the poster children of this technology at work. And I'll never forget this day we spent hearing testimony from Sikh farmers, just in the most beautifully colored turbans um, and a beautifully colored clothing, talking to us about what they had experienced. They talked about this package that they were told would help feed them and feed the future, the hybrid seeds, the fertilizer, the irrigation, the chemicals. And then they talked about what had happened in their region. We talked about um, how their water tables had been decimated, how their soil had been so damaged, about how farmers had become so indebted to this capital-intensive way of farming. Uh, they told us about neighbors actually going who were so indebted and saw no hope for the future. They were actually going into their fields and drinking the very pesticides that had so indebted them to commit suicide. At the end of one of these days of testimony, we actually uh, sort of retreated to a small hut that was, had a little bit of, of shade. And we were talking some more with these Sikh farmers that were telling us their story. It was an all-male group of farmers. And you know, in the beginning of this conversation, to be honest, they were kind of looking at us suspiciously. We were foreigners. We were women. Um, but they were, they were sharing with us what they were experiencing and this attempt to, to really try to think differently about how they were farming. We got to a question about trade policy. And I actually, I think, offhandedly mentioned that I had been at those WTO demonstrations in Seattle. I didn't mention the, the lesbian, the topless lesbian Avengers. Uh, and one of, as soon as I said that, the farmers kind of all kind of shifted how they were looking at me. And one of the farmers, his face kind of brightened up and he said, you were there? And I said, you know, yeah, I, I, I was in those streets. And he said, you know, when we saw that news, it was the first time we ever knew that there were people in your country who actually cared about what was happening in other parts of the world. And you know, I think back at my you know, moment of epiphany in those streets of Seattle, and to be honest, even then, I kind of secretly wondered, what difference was this all making, really? All this marching in the streets and the banner hang and all of that. Uh, I never really thought that I would learn about one of those ways in which that demonstration was making a difference, you know, sitting in that hut in the Punjab. So to really listen to these farmers is to see that these technologies, these agroecological technologies, are progress, and they're the solutions that we need to be investing in. The next question, the next big question then, I think, so we're thinking about you know, what does this future look like, is what is the future of seeds? I've got one more match, mashup for us, and that is this. On the left, we have a bag of genetically engineered seeds. On the right, we have a seed exchange in Latin America of uh, many, many varieties of corn. So what are we hearing about how we're going to feed the future? On the one hand, one of the stories we hear is this innovation of this new technology, genetic engineering. Uh, it was approved in this country in 1982. By 1999, here in the United States, we had about 100 million acres of farmland dedicated to GMOs. Uh, to date, uh, really the, one of the biggest producers of GMOs uh, uh, is Monsanto. There are a couple other companies, but it's a highly consolidated industry. 
And what's important to keep in mind about what we've seen in terms of the innovation in this area is to understand it's really been about engineering for just a couple of traits uh, or, or layering on those traits. So it's, it's one or the other or, or multiple. And what do those traits do? In the one hand, one type of trait that's been engineered is to engineer some seeds that, uh, with a gene from a soil bacterium causing the seeds to produce a protein toxic, toxic to certain insects. Uh, and then the other type of trait that we're see we've seen is seeds that are engineered to be herbicide resistant. Uh, and in the case of Monsanto's product, resistant to Roundup, otherwise known as glyphosate. In other words, if you plant with that genetically engineered seed that has that trait of resistance, you can spray glyphosate, you'll kill the weeds, hopefully, uh, but you won't hurt your crop. So we hear from the industry that's been pushing these seeds that one of the reasons why they've been promoting them is that this is the key to the future. We need this genetic engineering. Uh, what's important to remember, again, is there have just been a handful of traits that have been widely commercialized. What's also important to remember is if you look at what seeds are being engineered, they're not food we are eating directly, at least. Uh, in 2013, for instance, Monsanto, uh, when you look at their seed sales, 87% of their seed sales just came from corn, soybeans, and cotton. Uh, but also, we hear from them that these seeds, we need them because what are the other arguments for them? They're going to produce more. They're going to yield more, and therefore have a smaller footprint. Well, when you look at the yield record so far, now we actually have a lot of yield record in this country of what have we seen. It's pretty underwhelming. Uh, when you look at uh, what the industry says, uh, companies like Monsanto argue for corn, for instance, that from 1996 to 2008, corn yields shot up 28%. That's one of their claims. But Really, when you look at the data, it's a case of confusing correlation with causation. What I mean by that is, yes, in this country, yields did go up. They went up for a lot of crops. And when you actually look at the data and you look at why those yields went up, very little of that yield increase had anything to do with genetic engineering. It had to do with all kinds of other things we did in this country, like we passed legislation to encourage farmers to adopt some more sustainable practices. Uh, we did a lot of other things in conventional breeding and other things that had nothing to do with genetic engineering. One study that tried to put a number on it uh, argues that uh, the yield increase that you can attribute to genetic engineering engineering was just 4% uh, over that time. And then there are the problems, the problems of this technology. So how many of you have heard about uh, weed resistance to GMOs? So a few of you. So we, uh, in 2012, Iowa State University looked at this. They found over 60 million acres in the United States uh, now are infested with weeds that are resistant to glyphosate, that herbicide you're supposed to use with those genetically engineered seeds. There's another little problem with glyphosate you may have heard last year. The World Health Organization experts looked at glyphosate and now are determining that glyphosate is a probable carcinogen. And when you look at this data from, this is from the Center for Food Safety, you can see what has the introduction of genetically engineered seeds done. It's encouraged farmers to spray glyphosate. They don't have to worry, it's not gonna hurt their crop. So there's been a real increase in glyphosate uh, use. This slide takes us to 2012, but you can see when these glyphosate essentially resistant corn and soybeans were introduced and how much more glyphosate we've been using. Okay, so I've got this mashup. So what about non-genetically engineered seeds? You know, are they actually, you know, is this sort of the only alternative because non-genetically engineered seeds aren't going to help us? Um, well, what we, what we know from the evidence, again, what we are seeing is when we're looking at Evidence from around the world of farmers that are adopting agroecological practices and using seeds that many times you can save seeds and share seeds and re reuse seeds, uh, what they're finding is that yields are going up. One study out of the University of Essex in the UK found when farmers transitioned to agroecological practices in Africa, they found yields going up 116%. Um, so there's... Um, you know, there's a lot of hope in these, in, in these seeds that we're seeing. Uh, again, we're seeing it in evidence all around the world. Um, the, the final thing I'll say on this is that you know, one of the other claims about genetically engineered seeds is that they're going to produce more nutritious crops. You might have heard about this, that like vitamin A uh, is a major global health problem. Maybe we can genetically engineered seeds to have more vitamin A. Well, 
while we've been hearing this promise for a long time, what we're seeing, again, on the ground are communities actually growing food that's high in vitamin A, that's addressing vitamin A deficiency. A report just came out today, actually, from the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa, documenting 55 case studies across Africa of agroecological solutions on the ground that are producing more nutritious food with higher yields and ultimately helping farmers uh, not have to pay so much for inputs. So what I'm asking us to do when we think about how we're going to feed the future is to think about how we approach this idea of what is innovation and what is technology. To be asking questions of any new technology, of the folks you're gonna see next week who are coming up with innovations in the food space. Um, does this technology promote health, food producer well-being and, the envi and, and, a, and a healthy environment? Who benefits, who loses? Does it increase or decrease power for farmers? And are there unintended consequences? And so I mentioned at the top of the talk that I have some good news to report, and I do. The good news is that this message of the benefits of agroecology agro is taking root. Uh, that again, we're seeing the evidence in studies from around the world. The most seminal one is a study called uh, the, uh, and I wanna know how many of you have ever heard of this one, called the International Assessment of Agricultural Knowledge and Science Technology for Development. I, can, I have to read my notes because I can never remember the title of this report. Uh, it's known by its acronym IAASTD, which again is a terrible acronym unless you're actually you know, writing about sexually transmitted diseases. Has anybody ever heard of the ISTAD report? Has anybody ever heard of the IPCC for climate change? It won a Nobel Peace Prize, this group? Okay, so ISTAD is sort of, if you know what IPCC is, this is like our report for food of what IPCC is for climate. It was commissioned by the World Bank and other institutions. Uh, it was produced by 900 experts from 110 countries. And one of its big conclusions is that if we persist with business as usual, the world's people cannot be fed over the next half century. Uh, it will mean more environmental degradation and the gap between the haves and have nots will expand and they said in this report, we have an opportunity now to marshal our intellectual resources to avoid that sort of future. So what does it mean to transform business as usual? Again, it means investing in the kind of innovations I'm talking about. Uh, it means seeing things like what we're seeing on a huge scale around the country, like uh, in Andhra Pradesh, where in 2004, community groups started a pilot study teaching 300,000 farmers how to use natural approaches to pesticides. Uh, they were taught these natural alternatives and in the, in replace these natural alternatives with toxic insecticides. And the result is that their yields have been going up, they've kept the pests away, and the farmers are benefiting also because they're spending less on chemicals. Today, that program in Andhra Pradesh has expanded to roughly one million farmers across one million hectares in the state. Now, the success of this agroecology is not unique to Andhra Pradesh, but I'm guessing uh, you may be unfamiliar with these stories, even the term agroecology. Of course, actually, maybe not all of you because you actually go to the un a university with some of the world's leading agroecology experts and you're in the edible education class, but how many of you have heard the term agroecology before? Right, so you're a totally unrepresentative sample of the nation. Uh, but it is, uh, I, I actually, out of curiosity, I searched the New York Times to see uh, if there has been any mention of the term agroecology in that paper of record. It likely won't shock you that there have been only 14 mentions of the word agroecology. Most of them were in uh, vows and obituaries for people that used to work at a place called the Center for Agroecology. Uh, of course, there were a couple Mark Bittman columns in there, and there was actually only one article that had any substantive mention of agroecology in the New York Times. And that ISTAD report, we already discussed it. Most of you had never heard of it. And that's not unusual. Most times, nobody I, has, uh, nobody I meet has heard of it. Uh, and again, none of that is a surprise. So that ISTAD report, it was signed by 57 countries, but not the United States. That ISTAD report, it was endorsed by leading agricultural experts all around the world, but it was condemned by the chemical agriculture industry when they realized 
that what the evidence would lead to would be a story that we need to be moving away from chemical agriculture. And in fact, in an absolutely uh, outraged opinion piece in The Economist, uh, the chemi a couple chemical companies and CropLife International and condemned the report as being misleading. So uh, it's not that these stories, we're not hearing them because this movement is marginal. We're not hearing them because of the kind of pressure we're getting uh, and to, to tell a different story. Um, so, you know, when I look at where we're getting our stories about food, how that narrative is getting built, there are millions of dollars being spent to really shape what we think about food. Uh, the industry is spending millions on public relations efforts. Uh, trade groups are as well. Uh, I'll just mention one example of this. Uh, a few years ago, the Biotechnology Industry Organization, the trade group representing the genetically engineered seed companies hired PR firm Ketchum to help them uh, shape their image. And what they developed was a website called GMO Answers. You'd go to that website, it looked like experts weighing in on big questions about the industry. What you didn't realize is that many of those experts were actually staff at Monsanto. Many of those experts actually had direct ties, financial ties to the industry. And um, the Ketchum actually uh, sort of bragged about how uh, great this campaign was when uh, they also said they would go onto Twitter and use algorithms to look at how people were talking about GMOs. And if you posted a, uh, a, a concern about GMOs or something critical, they would uh, direct message you to go look at GMO answers to get your answers without saying, you know, dot, 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 this was paid for by the biotech industry. Um, so, you know, despite this kind of media blackout about this movement, you know, I'm really seeing, uh, and this is where the hope comes in, I am seeing this movement really emerging all around the world. Um, when I was in Istanbul with IFOM, uh, when I was in Istanbul, I was hearing these amazing stories of the spread of agroecology globally, hearing about groups like La Via Campesina, which was founded in 1993 and now counts 164 local and national organizations from 73 countries representing 200 million farmers. When I was in Istanbul, I met people like Gabriela Sota from Costa Rica, who described the excitement among 5,000 farmers there realizing the greater productivity and lower costs because of agroecology. I met Makareta Tawa from Fiji, who described the movement in her island nation to go 100% organic. I met people after people that were really sharing these stories. Um, and what I was hearing was this message. And I'm hearing the other piece of hope I'm here to say is that this message we are not hearing only in the halls of the organic farming movement uh, summits. We're hearing it in mainstream media too. Um, so this quote, many people will tell you organic food is just for rich people, that it's not an economical way to approach agriculture, that it can't feed the world. Well, guess what? None of that's true. And you know where I heard that? It wasn't in one of my mother's books. It was actually on CNBC with this guy, Jim Cramer, you know, the investor. So, you know, I think when Jim Cramer starts sounding like the Institute for Food and Development Policy, I think maybe we're starting to mainstream this message uh, a little bit. Um, so, you know, in closing, what I want to say is I think when we are pondering these big questions about how we're going to feed the future, that to do so, we must work on kind of busting our mythologies about technology, really looking at the consolidated power that pushes one form of technology over another and build the kind of people power that I saw in those Seattle streets. And, and what, I'm, what I'm seeing and what is so encouraging is that people all around the world are doing just that, that they are calling for a new direction, one that braces agroecology at its heart. So, as I was thinking about this talk, um, I was actually uh, last week in Raleigh, North Carolina at the inaugural summit of a new alliance of food movement organizations here in the United States. It's called HEAL Food Alliance for uh, the acronym Health, Environment, Agriculture, and Labor. And it brings together groups working on all of those different issues. There were nearly 100 of us from across the country. The, uh, the youngest person was 15. The oldest was 75. There were Somali farmers from Minnesota, black farmers from the South, organizers from the Central Valley here in California. There were Latinos and Muslim Americans, South Asian, white and black. And, and I couldn't help but contrast 
that experience with that gathering among the futurists at Airbnb headquarters. And I couldn't help but feel in a way that that Heal Food Alliance Summit was my signal of the future. That to me, those people in that room really represent the kind of diversity of movements that are fighting for a future of food that has producers at the center, including all of those who labor across the food chain, uh, a kind of food system that promotes a healthy environment and that has all of us fed, not an industrially produ produced concoction, uh, but fed on real healthy and delicious food. So when I lie awake in bed at night, uh, worried about the future of food, I need only think of the people I saw in Istanbul, the voices that I have heard around the world promoting agroecology, and the faces in that 100-person large circle at a hotel on the outskirts of Raleigh to remember where the real answers lie. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Could, how about a few questions? Oh, yeah, oh, sure. Yeah, um, let me, I've got some written down here. I don't know if you got to see them. Come sit over here, have a glass of water. Have a Kishu Mandarin, courtesy of Those Alice Waters. Um, thank you so much, that was really compelling. I'm, I feel grateful that you're out tracking signals. Mm -hmm. And um, I think for this class, it's so important for us to um, be able to know which signals to pay attention to, and then also to begin to understand how our actions either can, you know, reinforce a, sim uh, a signal uh, unknowingly, or how we can actually intentionally amplify the signals of the things that we care about to get to that three-legged stool of, mm -hmm. of, of sustainable health and well-being. Yeah. Um, Jason Block, are you here tonight, Jason? Where are you, Jason? Okay, you're busted. <laughs> anyway, you, you wrote a really good question. So Jason um, wrote, how do you personally discern truth and fiction mm. with regards to food? And is there ever a time that you switched your opinion on your journey for yeah. food truth? That is a great question, especially in this age of um, fake, fake news, right? And alternative, and alternative facts. facts. Oh my God. <laughs> um, so how, uh, you know, I think, um, I am a, just a naturally curious person and I constantly ask questions and one of the things that I have really tried, oh, you can't hear me, that I've tried to do is constantly question my own assumptions. I think we all need to do that. And so part of the way I do that is um, talking to people who I might not necessarily agree with is this Uh, you know, ability to change that, but uh, I would walk into work. Coming in from. We have a problem. I've had that happen before. We'll, keep, yeah. we'll keep going. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah okay. Great. Okay. So, um, so how do I tell? So, the, okay, a couple things. Um, number one, uh, always, whenever you read something, dig. Who said it? Do they have a conflict of interest? What can you know about them? Um, you know, I think one of the things my colleagues and I did a report a couple years ago called Spinning Food, and it was about essentially this whole universe, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars universe that was being spent to create essentially fake organizations, front groups, so organizations that sound like they are working for public interest, but they're actually funded by chemical agriculture or, you know, or corporate interests, so groups like the Coalition for Safe and Affordable Food. You might think you could go to them and they might help you understand what would be safe food. Well, you would have to do some digging, but you know, the internet makes digging possible. And you would learn that the Coalition for Safe and Affordable Food is actually funded by uh, 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 proponents of chemical agriculture to try to push back against regulation, especially in this state around chemical agriculture. So number one, first and foremost, like always ask, what is the background, the story? And that's, you know, ask, you know, that part of, you know, my being transparent about where I'm coming from. And one of the reasons why in the work of Real Food Media, we take no uh, corporate donations 
because we don't want to seem, you know, we want to be able to not only be impartial, but be perceived as impartial. So number one, always check your sources. And number two, always ask, you know, continue to ask questions. Uh, you know, one of my, uh, I've had a sort of big moment going to see the, the father of the Green Revolution, Norman Borlaug, speak at, at Columbia University. And I went because I was like, well, you know, I've, I want to hear what, what he would have to say about this, this technology. And uh, when, when he was asked point blank questions about, well, you know, how do you, how do you respond to the fact that it increased social inequality? How do you respond to the fact that it increased chemical pesticide use? And uh, essentially his response around the chemical pesticide use and illnesses and sickness, he said, people aren't really getting any sicker. It's people are able, we're able to detect uh, part, down to now the parts per million, parts per billion of chemical residues, but it's not actually people being more sick. So going to the sources, really constantly questioning your, uh, what, you know, your own assumptions is really important. So, um, you know, there was a, a, a famous Russian mystic named George Gurdjieff. Have you ever heard of him? He um, was a philosopher and he sort of uh, talked about people being in a waking sleep you know, that we go through our lives almost automatically with so many of our choices and decisions. And he created all kinds of exercises for people to help wake them up to this. And I think about our kind of automation of food and that vision that you gave of the food executive of like, well, everything will just be made for us. How do you, you've thought a lot about this. What recommendations or suggestions do you have for people just to wake up in their own lives mm to you know, kind of checking their automation mm -hmm. about their choices where we may be you know, participating in furthering a food system that we don't really want to have. Right. Well, you know, we all, for those of you, you know, I don't know about the folks from Denmark, but we here in the Bay Area are very fortunate in that there are so many ways in which we can directly connect to food workers, food producers in ways that isn't always the case. Um, and it doesn't necessarily it's not, that's not necessarily only for those of us who can afford to do so. So one of the ways I think we can kind of wake ourselves up is to connect ourselves to real food however and whenever we can. Uh, and to also, you know, again, push ourselves to have some experiences going to a farm, getting in the dirt, you know, getting connected with where our food is coming from in that way. You know, we're getting involved. There's a lot of opportunities locally to get involved with also food preparation. There's a wonderful group called the People's Kitchen Collective that does huge communal free meals. Uh, and it's a fabulous way, again, to connect to, to, to each other, but also to real food, to preparing food. Uh, so those are, are some of the things that... Um, and real food media would give us a lot more And real food media is a way to yeah. get connected to us and to find out about some of those resources. You'll be happy to know that next week, one of the readings is called The Future of Food is Food, oh. which was written by Steve Case there in Recode. And then there's actually a reading that I wrote next week, which talks about um, how two former Berkeley students started Revolution right, Foods. Right. To feed um, school children, and then the third reading is really from the MIT Technology Review, which gives a overview of all the technologies that are coming, you know, into the right. world of food. For right. And, yeah. and what I hope was clear from I hope you know what was clear from the talk is that I'm absolutely not anti-technology, right? But that we need to be sure technology gets embedded in our social values. So I mentioned some of those values of what kind of food system we want. So making sure that any new technology it kind of passes that litmus test. Is it helping us get closer to that kind of sustainable food system that meets those, those three values? And if not, maybe we should rethink it. That came through loud yeah. and clear. Okay, Thank good. you, Anna LaPay, for being here with us tonight. Yeah. So um, one of Anna's stories reminded me with, with, um, about Ketchum was that there's a, another very large uh, public relations agency, which I won't mentioned by name right now, but that um, actually had a real dilemma where one part of their practice was working on um, health and well-being and promoting the prevention of chronic diseases, and another part of their practice was actually promoting the companies that were creating the products that caused those diseases, and it created a bit of a kind of internal cultural conflict because more and more people want to work 
in a place where their values align with their place of work. This is becoming increasingly important. And um, you know, I was really moved and inspired when I met Sophie Egan when she was a graduate student. I was working on a project called Food at Work to explore the role of food in the workplace and the responsibility of employers to think about fostering um, healthy employees and a more productive workforce and less medical costs down the line by actually integrating and educating people about food and making it easy for people to eat food at work. And Sophie played a really um, key role in us articulating the narrative of that story. So much of what we're doing and what I take away from both of our speakers today is just the power of the narrative to be well-researched, to be fact-based, to be able to support your assertions and to let your curiosity guide you. When I was reading your book, Anna, I was just really struck by your, you know, your sense of curiosity, your, your optimism. You, weren't, um, you, didn't, you, you don't speak with condemnation. You're really trying to offer practical solutions. And you know, I think one of the things I hope comes out of um, edible education is that our students feel empowered um, and to develop some of the kind of skillful means around narrative. So this is a segue to invite Sophie um, to the podium. Sophie Egan is the author of Devoured. And um, if Jason Block were here today, I was going to give him a copy of the book. <laughs> but I'm going to give it to Atisha instead for doing the um, survey. So you could go up to um, Sophie afterward, and she'll sign it for you. Please welcome Sophie Egan. Test, test, test. No, test. Can you hear me? No. More fun with microphones. Can anyone in the back hear me? Yes. Awesome. OK, I, that doesn't sound great. All right, I think we're all situated here. Clicker, water, yes, good evening, everyone. You can hear me. OK, Anna knows how this goes. Um, it is a huge honor to be here tonight um, among, well, really on the roster of this incredible food course um, with some of my all-time food heroes, I have to say. Um, the people who come here are honestly living legends. Um, so it's, it's a tremendous honor. And thank you so much, Will, for the invitation to speak. So before I share some insights about uh, or from my book, I want to tell you a little bit about my path and where, um, how I got to where I am now professionally. So where I am professionally is uh, I, have, I, I wear a number of hats. So I am a director at the Culinary Institute of America, the CIA. Let that sink in. Um, I oversee all of our food service industry thought leadership initiatives related to health and sustainability. So we provide culinary strategies for making menus better for human and environmental health. Then on the side, I am also a writer. I contribute to the New York Times health section, and I have written this book, Devoured. So my, my path is rather unconventional. And uh, I, my story has a lot of similar um, aspects with, the, with those of Anna's, where it took me a while to, to figure out how to plug in. Uh, so in college, I studied history and math. I got involved with food by managing a student dining hall. And I studied abroad in Bologna, which is the stomach of Italy. After college, I spent about three years as a food and travel writer for Sunset Magazine, which was a lot of fun. Uh, but I really wanted to have a broader impact. So that's when I came to the UC Berkeley School of Public Health. I um, did the health and social behavior concentration, and I really took advantage of all the different departments and colleges on this campus, kind of cobbling together a food systems lens through which to view public health. I went over to the Goldman School and took food policy with Saru Jayaraman. I went to the journalism school and took food writing with Michael Pollan. I thought edible education was so engrossing that I took it twice. And during my time at Berkeley, there were three pivotal moments that have really shaped my trajectory. 
The first was during Michael Pond's food writing class uh, when I wrote a story about stunt foods and Doritos Locos Tacos. This wound up being the cover story for Wired Magazine's first ever issue on food. And that eventually became one of the key chapters in my book, Devoured, which covers the broader topic of American food culture. The second key moment was actually the last semester that I was here at Berkeley, and I was taking Eat, Think, Design, which is an incredible interdisciplinary class. And that's when I met Will Rosenzweig. Uh, as he mentioned, I had the chance to work on the Food at Work initiative. And that actually led to the job that I hold now at the Culinary Institute of America. And in Will, I gained an incredible mentor. The last moment was actually just a couple weeks before graduation, again in that Eat, Think, Design class. And one of the instructors, uh, Jaspal Sandhu, I was telling him how I was really struggling with what I was going to do next. I didn't really consider myself a public health person, per se, um, but I really wanted to have an impact on these, these kind of food issues that I cared so much about. And he looked at me and he said, you want to really make a difference? Go work at Walmart. And he kind of just let that hang there for a minute. And at first, I thought he was kidding. Um, but the more I thought about it, the more I realized the enormous opportunity that comes with sitting across from people, from some of the biggest, comp biggest players in this system, and with companies perhaps whose values are most at odds with my own. Now, that's really what I love about my, my job at the Culinary Institute, where we take what my boss, Greg Drescher, calls a big tent approach. So I get to work with some of the most cutting edge companies, Google, you know, campus dining programs, remarkable K-12 school food programs. But I also work with the McDonald's and the Taco Bells of the world. Um, and these companies that feed millions of Americans every day, if we can get them to make very small changes to their menus, from phasing out antibiotic use in the meat supply to reducing default portion sizes, that can have an enormous impact on human and environmental health. So I am so grateful for the uh, exceptional educators um, who helped shape my, my path and, and my career thus far. And I really just want to urge all of you um, to take advantage of the incredible people and the incredible opportunities that exist on this campus. During grad school, but also before, as a writer, I spent a lot of time researching and thinking about what contribution, if any, I might make to the national dialogue about food and society. There's this incredible canon that's been left to us, right? Michael Pollan and Anna LePay, Eric Schlosser and Michael Moss and so forth. And what I landed on was what I consider an underappreciation for the power of social and cultural norms to shape eating behavior for better and for worse. What's socially normal and acceptable, these things are, are pervasive forces that, that really affect all of our individual actions. But they're like water to fish or air to humans. You can't see them, but they're always there. And amidst this environment, this social climate, if you will, um, I, was really, I was really trying to find out what, what um, collectively, what might be said about a national food culture, about a shared uh, way of relating to food. So I was driven by this question. What unites us as eaters in America? And I don't know about you, but in the wake of the election, I feel like uncovering what unites us as anything in America is perhaps more worth understanding today than ever before. So in the course of my research, I found that there are these three core values that are deeply ingrained in what I call the, our, our food psyche, the American mindset. Um, I know you've talked a lot about values in this class. And three core values that, that I um, discovered have been with us from our founding as a nation and today shape our eating habits in profound ways. Those values are work, freedom, and progress. Tonight, I want to just elaborate briefly on the value of freedom. This is independence. So 
one of the things that really um, stood out to me in my research was that individualism is actually one of the most defining attributes uh, of us as, as Americans. We think of ourselves as distinct and separate from others, as opposed to part of a larger collective. Very few people want to be described as average, right? That's like an insult. We want to be exceptional. We want to be our own special snowflake. Um, and this independence orientation, as opposed to interdependence, shapes our eating habits in some really fascinating ways. One of the key ways is customization. We seek to personalize and customize more and more of our food experiences. Does anyone know what this number refers to? That is the estimated number of drink combinations at Starbucks. <laughs> Whether you realize it or not, each time you step up to that Starbucks counter and announce your four adjective long frappuccino order, you are expressing your identity. You are actually intentionally and joyously deviating from a prescribed box. And customization, interestingly, goes back to <clears throat> the 1970s um, and the Burger King slogan, have it your way. What was so ironic about this, of course, was that it was the furthest thing from having it your way. It was all of holding the pickle. And today, though, we have countless fast casual chains, right? The Chipotle of every kind of cuisine, build your own models, um, and more and more customization is expected. So I want to share with you a very brief passage from my book on the chapter uh, that's called Having It Our Way. Consumer Insights researcher Michael Berry calls directing your order, adding tomato or doubling the pepper jack, chefing. Berry says that chefing has been happening at places like Subway and Baskin Robbins for years, and it's so widespread we don't think twice about it. By contrast, food psychologist Paul Rosen says, quote, the French, for example, have a very strong national cuisine that they love, so you don't mess around with it, end quote. You would never walk into a French restaurant and start adding your own ketchup or salt and pepper to your entree, he points out. In the United States, though, chefing is expected. And it's about more than nailing your favorite combination of sandwich toppings. It's about not feeling like a quote-unquote cog in a machine, Barry says. Quote, when you go to McDonald's and see it with fresh eyes, it's pretty terrifying. There are data displays, shoots that stuff flies down, things are beeping and buzzing. So it's this idea of I won't be processed, end quote. Removing and adding and dictating even the smallest specification goes a tremendous distance in our minds. You could order a chicken sandwich that's been lying around for weeks in who knows what dank corner of the walk-in freezer, but then a deli counter worker heats it up, tops it with a lettuce leaf and the pesto aioli you sub for standard mayo, and your perception is that it's been transformed. According to Barry, when a fast food worker merely looks at customers while preparing their meals, they report their food actually tastes fresher. Chefing, he says, is in many ways about regaining some amount of control. It's about seeing who is making your food and what kind of treatment it receives before arriving in your belly. Chefing is also about freshness, yet another trait we value in our food, and it's one that is at odds with other values. Depending on our individual situations, most of us don't have time slash make time slash feel like spending time preparing our own food. Yet the machinery designed for mass production is not built for delivering food that is either fresh or individualized. The processing and preparation happen far away from the site of consumption, and the result will be nearly identical for every customer. Adding that lettuce or tomato is about denying this reality. In addition to customization, what independence what our independence mindset does for us in terms of our eating habits is it leads us to eat by ourselves. Solo dining is actually at an all-time high, and this is coinciding with an all-time high of a, of a related condition, which is social isolation. And this deeply concerns me because if you look at the literature, the single greatest predictor of happiness is social connectedness. You heard Alice Waters talk about this, right, with the slow food value, how we're all interconnected. So this is a real problem. With that, I want to leave you with a challenge, and that is to meet at the table. 
Solo dining is driven by this in independence mindset, this right, you know, sense that it's our right to eat what we want, when we want, however much we want, with or not with whomever we want. But it's also driven by lack of time, or at least perceived lack of time. And one of those, one, one of the root causes of lack of time is overwork. In the United States, we place an incredible premium on productivity, and we're known around the world for our work ethic. But today, we're actually even outworking ourselves by about 200 more hours per year compared with a generation or two ago. And we're taking, the least, we're taking vacation at the lowest rate in 40 years. That doesn't leave a whole lot of time for, for food. And from childhood, we are imbued with this sense that food is fuel. It is the pit stop. It's to min something that you should minimize to get on with your day to the things that truly matter in life. And <clears throat> think about elementary school. Right? I mean, kids get 15 minutes to wolf down a greasy slice of pizza. By the time they're in college, uh, I have dining directors I work with around the country who are telling me how they've designed these beautiful spaces for eating that, that are meant to foster mindfulness and de-stressing, only to see the grab-and-go items fly off the shelves. They can't keep up with demand for things that are portable and preferably one-handable. So you can you know, scroll through your phone or like, guide your bike with the, you know, one hand. In, in adulthood, this manifests in that national epidemic known as sad desk lunch. Raise your hand if you've used your keyboard as a placemat. We've all been there. And it's really this sense, as I mentioned, that food is, is not nearly as important as whatever else we have to do. So to overcome those kinds of situations, we're going to need systemic change, right? Policy change that allocates more time for school lunch. Um, or great programs like Edible Schoolyard. We'll, we're going to need cultural change at the institutional level. Employers making it culturally normal to take a real lunch break so that you don't have to be the you know, salmon swimming upstream. But in the meantime, and to help us get there, there are individual actions that each of you can take um, that can really start to put food first. So, so a couple of easy examples. Brunch. Weekend brunch is one of those rare times that many of us push the pause button. Um, I have a chapter called Secular Church, where I connect it to a decrease in, in the percentage of us who are affiliated with organized religion. And church really can become this, this place for community, a way of breaking bread and, and marking the passing of time. Um, during the week, uh, one of the greatest ideas I've heard is called a lunch bunch, where if you work in an office or maybe just even um, as a student, you and several friends or colleagues grab four, um, split up the five days of the week, and alternate cooking for each other and take a lunch break all together. You could have a, a supper club where you all uh, you know, get together and, and cook with friends and family. Because by the way, cooking is how you can actually have it your way. So together, collectively, these individual actions will start to take food issues from the outer rings of our societal, of our societal orbit and put them smack in the middle. Together, these, these steps you can take can help America revive something that it's lost, which is the art of commensality and conviviality. So as I mentioned, Meet at the table. Now, the table part is negotiable. It could be a picnic blanket. I'm good with park benches. But it's the meeting that I must insist upon. Thank you for your time. Thank you so Oops. Thank you so much. There you go. That's really yes, inspiring. Sure. And I love hearing your path. Thank you. you. Hear me now? Yeah. Um, I love hearing your, your path from school to full employment. That's, <laughs> that's wonderful to hear. Um, I also wanted to thank um, Ryan Peterson, one of our members of the teaching team, he has constructed the first official Edible Education 101 Facebook page at UC Berkeley, Edible Education 101 at UC Berkeley. So 
I'd like to see 156 likes right now from your clicker. No, it's not hooked up to do that, unfortunately. But please um, share this. This is a great way for us to um, take the generosity of one of our Berkeley um, alumni who has generously made our um, classes able to be videotaped and live streamed. So this is where you can point your friends when you say, wow, you should have heard Anna and Sophie last week. They were awesome. This is a way to help them um, connect easily to the recordings of the class. I'm going to stop just a few minutes early. So those of you that want to stay and that want to talk to Anna and Sophie can do so. And thanks for coming again tonight. Drive safely, get safely home, and see you next week with the Food Tech tasting menu.